set. start like that. I, I saw the guy who invented Dolby THX sound present once and he started like that and I just thought all conferences must start like that from now on. Um, that's me. Uh, I'm Russell Davis. Mike is coming later. Um, you can tell which one is he, he is because he's the middle-aged white man with a beard. Um, the, uh, and we are from the Government Digital Service and actually so are quite a lot of you, I believe. Um, <laughs> So, hello. Um, some of this you'll have seen before. Some of this actually will be completely new to you. So, um, that will be interesting too. Um, we're part of the UK government, part of the Cabinet Office. We are a mix of all these kinds of people. We are unashamedly public servants. Um, and uh, we care about users. That is our kind of prime motivation. What we're going to talk about today is I'm going to do a little bit about who we are and what we do uh, and some of the things we've learnt. Uh, and then Mike is going to talk about uh, this thing that we're starting to think about and talk about, which we're calling the GovStack. Um, so kind of half me, half him. I, you think of me as the Kaiser Chiefs and him as Springsteen, basically. Um, we exist... Um, because of this letter um, here, written uh, by Martha Lane Fox. She was the government's digital champion um, and uh, was asked to report on the government's two big kind of consumer-facing websites, uh, DirectGov and BusinessLink, uh, and she wrote a very uh, readable, it's still worth reading now, kind of six-page report, basically saying not only do you need to do quite a lot about uh, those websites to make them better. Um, you need to uh, overhaul everything the government does online, basically. Uh, and she conveniently, for us, titled that Revolution, Not Evolution. Um, and fr but from that, kind of, we got our mission, basically, to go and um, kind of overhaul the government's digital estate. Because the good thing was, not only did she write that letter, but Francis Maud who's the Minister for the Cabinet Office, wrote back and said, yes, we will do that. We will do the things in your report. Our mission, uh, if you boiled that letter down, is, is sort of four things. Create GDS, which is us, which is um, a group of people who know what they're doing uh, in terms of digital stuff at the centre of government. Uh, our first big task was to fix publishing, so all the information that government publishes online, put it on a single domain, etc. Uh, then go out and start trying to fix transactions, so those are occasions when people kind of transact with government. And then the fourth thing, go wholesale. Um, you know, how do you, how do you start to take it so that the government doesn't have to do all that itself, publishing APIs and that kind of stuff. To do that, there are kind of five big tasks. The first is gov.uk. Um, and we, uh, at the end of last year, had to go and present to the cabinet and tell them what we were doing. Um, and, you know, we had to get from scratch, for assuming that some of them probably won't have seen anything on the, the website, to knowing something about it uh, quite quickly. So we made this little video to bring it to life. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ali Adiwami, I work at the Government Digital Service, and I'm here to tell you about GovUK. We launched Gov.uk in October 2012. It replaced the two big central government websites, DirectGov and BusinessLink. The idea was to make something simpler, clearer and faster, something focused on users. Firstly, we took a careful look and worked out what services and information we actually needed to deliver. We thought, for instance, that we could probably stop spending taxpayers' money telling people how to have a win abroad or how to identify different kinds of waves. We eliminated thousands of pages that no one ever visited. Then we made sure that the information we were providing was as easy to find and to follow as possible. This, for example, is the page on DirectGov that tells you about bank holidays. Now, it has all the information you need, and you'd think it'd be hard to do it better. But looking at how people actually use the site, we realised that what most people were searching for was the date of the next bank holiday. So we put that right at the top of the page, big and bold. We've done the same thing to more complex tasks, 
like working out how much maternity pay you're entitled to. Before, on DirectGov, you'd need to read all this information. On gov.uk, you just need to answer a few simple questions and the site calculates the answer for you. In April 2013, we finished moving all departmental sites to gov.uk, together with the sites for number 10 and the Deputy Prime Minister's office. So instead of every government page having a different design and different navigation, every site now looks and works the same way. At the same time, we've rethought how policy is presented online. Before gov.uk, if you wanted to understand government policy on something like gangs, for instance, you'd have needed to visit all these separate pages. Now, there's a single page for each policy, and all the departments involved share the responsibility for keeping it up to date. You can even subscribe to those policy pages so that you're always kept informed of any changes. And if you're responsible for a particular policy, you can find out how often it's being looked at and how closely it's being read. Today, gov.uk is handling more web traffic than the site it replaced at a far lower cost, and users get to the information they need quicker than they did before. gov.uk is not perfect, and it's not finished. It's never going to be. It's designed to improve, to react to user needs. We've made thousands of changes to gov.uk, and we make small improvements almost every day. This idea, iterative, responsive change, is at the heart of everything we do. You should visit us at www.gov.uk. Hopefully, you'll see something you like. Something simpler, clearer and faster. The, uh, one of the other things we do is we are building a federated identity system for uh, signing into government. Um, we're now responsible for uh, technology in central government, so the chief technology officer is part of GDS, which means basically that technology reports to digital, which means uh, technology reports to users. So it's, it's sort of about user need first rather than technology need first. Um, we have uh, a group uh, called Performance that does measurement and analytics for government. Um, and I thought this would be one of the rooms where people are actually interested in some of this. Um, so I did a screen grab yesterday of uh, a page we have, for instance, about the, li the, the tax disc service. So at 9 o'clock yesterday morning when I grabbed this screen, this was how many people were actually buying a tax disc. Uh, and this is the satisfaction with the service. This is how many of those users are digital, how many are doing it via the post office, etc. So for more and more services all the time, we're adding live information about how those services are being used, how well they're performing, all that kind of stuff. That is on the website in the public. If you go to gov.uk slash performance, you can navigate through to lots of information about how well services are being used, how well they're performing. I think this is one of those secret radical things that will turn out to be incredibly powerful once people start to realize it's there. All the time we show this around government and they go, oh, can I have that information? That would be really useful. And you can go, it's on the internet. Um, so th this kind of makes a difference. Um, the big program is, is transformation. That's the thing where we're is actually going out and we've got 25 big services uh, and, and making those better, doing digital transformation kind of through the whole process. Again, you can see where we're at with all those if you go to gov.uk slash transformation. You get a list of where we're at, how each service is, is doing, what stage we're at in the process. And what we normally talk about is the strategies delivery. We're not big on uh, lots of white papers about how we should do things. Um, it's mostly just getting on with it. Um, but that would make for a dull presentation. So um, we kind of thought we'd share some of the interesting stuff we've learned along the way. Uh, and that's to some extent about the tools and the platforms that we're building. First thing to realize is we had to start with the basics. Um, a lot of the work we've been doing is, is sort of effectively remedial. It's like fixing broken things. Uh, Michael talked a little, little bit about, more about this later. Um, because at the moment, government is a series of silos, all procuring their own tools and all reluctant to give any of them up. You know, it's departments and agencies, things like that, all doing their, their own things differently uh, and doing... and, and a lot of those things don't work well together. Uh, one of the um, uh, 
government that is, is always cited for doing digital really well is Estonia. Um, they've got kind of a fantastic entirely digital government system. Um, and the interesting thing is uh, if you ask and talk to them about how they manage to do that, and in fact uh, our minister talks about this all the time, the two advantages that they had was no money and no legacy. Um, the, the, because basically, um, as uh, this quote from uh, one of the Estonian um, uh, people who developed the system said, when the Soviets left, they took everything with them. Uh, and Estonia had the opportunity to start from scratch. Um, uh, I'm rather more kind of bluntly, uh, the economic affairs <laughs> minister kind of said. <laughs> You know, so the, the, we do not have that opportunity. Um, you know, there's a lot of legacy there, and that, that sort of needs to be dealt with. And there's also a kind of legacy attitude. I mean, government thinks it's really big and complex. And uh, in physical terms, it probably is. It does kind of big, important things all over the country. In digital terms, it's not. It's probably about the size of a, of a semi-popular dating site. Um, <laughs> but that kind of... Um, that, that's a difficult mindset for people to get over. And its ICT hasn't necessarily been well spent. Uh, this is a chart from Booz that kind of on the bottom basically says how much value you get out of the money you've spent on uh, technology. And uh, only Sweden and uh, Switzerland have spent more than us on technology kind of and, and got uh, less return for it. Now, we don't know why Sweden... There's a sort of statistical anomaly in there. And the Swiss one is because they include the cost of a particle accelerator um, in, their, <laughs> in their charts. So, um, you know, there's a kind of... Uh, we spend a lot of money. We don't get a lot of value for it. Uh, and actually, this is a picture I took of, of Mike visiting one of our departments. Uh, we, we talk a lot about a kind of learned helplessness um, inside departments or, or inside government um, that, you know, just like it's too big and complicated, we don't know how to deal with this. Uh, and the complexity is a, a, a lot of the problem a lot of the time. Similarly, in the kind of policy profession, uh, the people who determine how things are done, it's still a world of Word documents, uh, of, of long papers about stuff. Um, we don't do much of that. Um, and say what you like about GDS, um, at least you can read our slides. That is one competitive advantage I think we have around government. Um, but government data lives in spreadsheets and macros and PDFs. Um, it's kind of, it's hard to get at. Um, there's important stuff in there. But it's telling that although we, government has made massive inroads in how it uses uh, data, uh, and how it gets things up to date. The kind of state of the art to some extent is, is this, it's QDOS and it's quarterly. You know, the fact that your data is quarterly um, kind of suggests something about how live you're being with some of those things. And, you know, a lot of, though pol politicians actually have been forced to engage with digital stuff because that's how you have to get elected these days, people at the top of uh, professions and departments haven't necessarily. So we're kind of not doing anything startling. Many of you won't kind of be bowled over by uh, startling and original technology ideas we've had. We're just trying to introduce the basic tools of the internet age to government. Um, and five thoughts about that. The first is, um, it's about changing the organizing principle. It's about changing the central idea about why you're there. Um, and changing from building services that are about government needs to services that are about user needs. It sounds incredibly uh, sort of obvious, but it's a useful principle. Um, and the brilliant stuff about digital technology and the web and everything is that you can point to what is actually happening. A lot of the reason in that video when we had all those pages on DirectGov about uh, stuff like, you know, identifying waves and all that kind of stuff, the advantage with digital technology is you can say to people, no one looks at that page. We can get rid of it. There is no evidence of any actual need there. Um, and that's a sort of useful trump card. So, again, kind of one of the official, unofficial mottos um, is, is this is for everyone. You know, it's not, this is about every user in the country ought to be able to get this service in the way that's appropriate for them. 
Uh, and one of the, the little brilliant moments um, is that we are, um, last year or the year before, uh, um, we were able to get, or Francis Maud, who's our minister, stood up in the House of Commons and said this. Of the government digital service, which is committed to ensuring that as we uh, reform the delivery of public services, they are designed around the needs of the user rather than has been far too often the case in the past, being designed to suit the convenience of the government. And that's just a sea change in how governments think about the services they make, and that's important. The uh, second thing is a, a phrase of Tim O'Reilly's, work on stuff that matters. Uh, that kind of makes a difference. It's very easy to get enthralled by what's starting to be called in America kind of civic tech, you know, and the b building apps about um, the, the sort of important but to some extent small stuff of life, you know, bus stops and all that kind of stuff. We have deliberately gone in and tried to do the big, hard things. Um, working with 25 serv services, 14 agencies, uh, eight departments across, country, uh, across the country. This is a chart of all of government services. It's slightly out of date now, actually. Um, so there's, a, there's more than 660 services that government does with people. 90% of them, uh, by volume, are in that top 50. We are working to uh, overhaul and, and kind of make digital by default half of those, so 25 of those. So the vast majority of, of kind of transactions by volume by government will be done. The big ones are things like uh, stamp duty, that kind of happens automatically, and the things you'll know about um, driving licenses, passports, um, all that kind of stuff. The smallest one um, down there is uh, burial at sea. Applying, applying for a permit to be buried at sea is about 10 or 11 of those a year. We are not rushing to transform that digitally. <laughs> You can do that on paper if you wish. Um, one of those, for instance, is uh, this service, Lasting Power of Attorney, um, which was a paper-based, um, really complex service, um, so complex, in fact, most of the time people went to, uh, felt they had to get a solicitor to help them. We've turned that into a digital service that people like, and Mike will talk a little bit more about this at the end as well. Um, the only people upset about that are solicitors. Um, and we could probably live with that. The, uh, and that just went live uh, two weeks ago, I think it was. Um, so um, we made a little film to tell you a little bit about that. Okay, it stands for Lasting Power Attorney, and it's a deed that you put in place uh, where you appoint people to manage your affairs in case you were to ever lack mental capacity in the future. And we've just built the digital service so you can do that online. For users, it's much easier than the, the paper form. They can fill things in once rather than uh, repeatedly. We've built a clone button in because we know that people often want to make one lasting power attorney application based on another one. It means that they don't then have to fill out a lot of the forms. Um, they can reproduce it really quickly um, and just change the key details. There was a lot of form filling, there was a lot of duplication, so what our form does is it actually takes a lot of that out. It's far less daunting, the guidance and help is provided as you need it in context. My lady had come to us, she wanted to put a lasting power attorney in place. So this lady had started that process with a solicitor using the paper forms and in the middle of her doing that our beta service had come online and she'd taken the opportunity to do that by herself in front of her computer with her family so she saved herself some money because that was to her an unnecessary legal fee um, and she'd also managed to fill in that application that much more quickly and in the comfort of her own home. For our users it's just saving them so much time and money. You can see exactly which decisions you need to make and make them as easily as possible. And again, I think the interesting thing about that is that, you know, that's built by um, the Office of the Public Guardian, which is an agency of the Ministry of Justice. It's like, it's departments doing this. We are helping, but it's departments doing this. It's like, this, this stuff is getting good across government. Um, one of the other things we've uh, spent quite a lot of time thinking about is just changing the attitude. It's not necessarily about how you, who you work with, but it's, it's how you work. Um, our supplier base, if you looked it up, it kind of did a postcode lookup uh, of who our suppliers were uh, three or four years ago, 
you can kind of you can probably guess who they were, who our technology suppliers are, were from where they are based. Now they are here. Um, you know that that's about opening uh, government technology supply base up to more people, uh, to to different companies, uh, to a wider range of people. So yes, we can get access to kind of digital talent in you know, in Tech City, but also in, in Newcastle, in, in Swansea, in Manchester, you know, places where there are really good uh, digital skills. We need to, and close to where government services get made. Uh, so we need to be able to get at that. Um, and making things open turns out to be not just sort of ethically a good idea, but practically a really useful one. So we made a massive banner. Um, and um, we share things like uh, the design principles, um, which are kind of common sense statements of how you should approach the design of this stuff, but the fact that government says it and writes it down turns out to be really useful. Um, so I've had so many people come to us who say, I went into a meeting with those design principles and said, look, if the government's doing this, for God's sake, we should be able to do this. You know, we've got to be as good, at least as good as they are. Um, who knows who this is? Anyone know who this is? It is. <laughs> That's Margaret Calvert, who, uh, along with Jock Kinnear, designed the road signs uh, that we all see in the country, these. And they are kind of big design inspiration for us. Um, in some ways, that's the last big um, sort of public uh, design uh, task. Um, at, but it was extremely user-focused. You know, there's these brilliant pictures of them uh, kind of driving around airfields, uh, holding up signs and going, can you read it now? Can you read it now? Um, but that stuff gets shared. Um, it's hard to, hard to hide the road signs. And so it turns into a design pattern that gets used around the world, which turns out to be really useful. Um, the fact that wherever you go, the road signs work roughly. We share all our code on GitHub. We publish the service manual, which tells people how we do uh, the stuff we do. Um, and so you get benefits like this. So uh, Ministry of Justice are building a prison vi visiting um, code. And it turns out that there are loads of bits of government that have to do appointments. Um, and that their, their way of doing it for booking a prison visit might be useful for other bits of government. The fact that the code is sitting there open source means that bits of government can use that without having to do complex uh, procurement operations backwards and forwards. Or well, similarly, this is the uh, beta of gov.uk. Quite soon after that launched, uh, this arrived, which um, was the beta of Honolulu Answers website. Um, they just used our code, and, and, and that's fine. They actually used some of our content, which is arguably a mistake, because it's, um, <laughs> it's not the same. But, um, you know, that's a good thing. Uh, this is the beta of the New, New Zealand government website, again, using code from uh, our code base. This is how you get design patterns around the world. This is how you get a public service design pattern that spreads around the world. This would never happen if there was a United Nations committee <laughs> trying to enforce how public services work around the world. But sharing turns out to be a good way of doing it. Uh, and then, finally, we also have this um, kind of saying, show the thing. Um, a lot of government works uh, through big reports, three ring binders, you know, a lot of how, writing documents about how to procure the thing that you want. That you want. Um, what's useful these days is you can just build the thing in, in a lot less time than it takes to write the document. So this was a, a, a beta of a mapping thing we did for... Uh, the Rural Payments Agency, uh, and the, the fact that you could, you could build a, a, a working version of that in the same time as it might take to write a report about how to procure the working version of that is just sort of tremendously helpful. So, um, again, in our way, we made a poster, um, show the thing, uh, which is brilliantly starting to spread around government, so you start to see it up every now and then. So that's the kind of fixing the basic stuff. That's, that's me done. Um, but I, we're, getting, we're starting to get to the end of fixing the basics to some extent. And so we're kind of now starting to think about, okay, what comes next? Uh, and Mike is going to talk about that. Thank you.
Thanks, Russell. For those of you who blinked, seamless. Seamless. I put these glasses on for you so you can differentiate there was a change. It's not the same person. Not because I'm rampaging into middle age. Not at all. <laughs> what did I come into this room to do again? Um, slides. Right. It's good to see you. Some friends, some colleagues, some people who helped start GDS. Um, so this is for you. Um, we are going to show some new ideas here today. So for those colleagues in the room, uh, you're first up. You'll be seeing this uh, in work soon. Um, let's talk about the GovStack and uh, what we're all about. Um, we recently spoke um, at a conference in New York about this, and, uh, and this is what we said. Um, we don't talk much about what you've been discussing. We were talking really to the sort of civic tech Snowden Brigade um, because there's a, a, a healthy conversation going on about the future of government. And everyone's talking very sort of highfalutin terms about the future of government. Um, and we don't really because what we want to do is stuff like this. We just do this. We make people use services in a better way. We enable a better government because if you can do all these things, every time you do one of these things, um, it strengthens the connection between an individual or a business and the state. And in that connection lies the health and the well-being of democracy. Because we don't feel it's the, the sort of headlines that are really killing democracy. It's the drip, drip, drip of inadequate services. That um, is not a message that often gets played out when people are talking about the future of government, digital government, and so on, on the future of democracy. But we think it happens to be true. I remember when I first asked in government, and there was a, an issue about the, um, the West Coast train line, and a, a very senior civil servant put it to me that it was precisely these sorts of media flare-ups that undermined people's strength of democracy in democracy and in government. And I said, I very much doubt that. I'm pretty much sure it's people turning up to a an appointment with the government, finding it's been cancelled or can't get through on a call centre, doing that repeatedly. I think that undermines trust in government far more over a longer period of time than the one-off failure, because we're all human and we'll have those. So as Russell says, we've been concentrating on fixing things, and it has felt like that at times. Uh, and as a wise man here once said, Chris Orps here, our strategy is on delivery. It remains so. But we now need to sort of talk about why because we've spent three years fixing things. We continue to do that. That's not going to stop. But a lot of the remedial activity that we've had to do is coming towards an end. And certainly we're seeing other parts of government being able to do stuff more for themselves. Not always, uh, but in some cases, colleagues in MOJ, DVLA, and so on are now running with the ball, and that's really good to see. So whilst we normally confine our rhetoric to stickers, and we are pretty good at stickers, and for those of you who want to know, yes, we have got some more today. Um, what I really want to talk about today, today is an idea, and that idea is, is government as a platform. You've all heard that idea, right? We all think we know what that means. Um, and really what I, what I want to talk about is our version of government as a platform, because when Thea asked me to speak, he asked Russell and I to speak here, you know, it was uh, uh, very clear that what we're talking about was the best of British and the British culture and a British approach to things. So um, we tried some of these ideas out recently in New York, which is always a good place to start and leave the stage to the sound of your own footsteps. But I thought what we'd do today is talk a little bit about Governments of the Platform and what that means here now in the UK. Because we're actually trying to deliver it. Whether we are explicit about that or not, we have been doing that in government for the last three or four years. And there are many, many lessons that we've learned on that journey, but I just want to focus on two, really, today. Um, the first is this, and I'm telling this to some people around this audience as if they don't know it, but you have to start on the outside to finish on the inside. I'm sure Matthew would say that's right, wouldn't you, Matthew, from my society? Because this guy, Tom Steinberg, is probably the one of the best examples of that. Tom actually left government. He was a... Uh, is Tom here today? I don't think so. Um, uh, Tom left government. He was in a Treasury official uh, because he understood fundamentally that government wasn't any fit state to do the things that it probably needed to do in the internet era, and he set up My Society. And what differentiates Tom and My Society from many people outside of government 
is a few things, and a lot of that comes from the sort of maturity that they've shown. The first thing is when you're outside governments is to show people what's possible, um, rather than to show them what you're interested in. This is a common problem that we have with this disconnect between people inside and outside government. It manifests itself worse as in the sort of, why aren't you interested in my bus stop app? Well, actually, I'm trying to fix high speed too, and those things don't correlate. The biggest one, I suspect, is people outside of government and inside of government not sharing values or not showing that you share values. It is hugely important, I think, to have some empathy with people inside government. And I say that now after three years' experience um, because the pressures and uh, pulls on your time once inside government are uniquely challenging. And the third thing is showing you're sticking around because when you're inside government, you have to do things for the long term. You have to do things that endure. So those, those are the sort of three values that, that we talk about. And, and really talking about, I, I'll get on to why Governments of the Platform works, because Governments of the Platform needs people inside and outside government working together. And not all of us here, us friends here, but many of, in many cases that isn't working very well. And I think there's a number of cases, reasons why. I've talked about the, the absence of values. There's another issue, which is when people like us get inside and we've been outside, it's to go after big, boring problems in big, boring buildings. There is this idea, and you'll read about it in every media outlet in this country, that government should do this and democracy should do that. And actually, it fails to connect with that, that this is what government looks like. It's really boring. It's quite old. It's often late Edwardian Baroque and it's really not very nice to, to work in. But that's what democracy looks like. And if we forget about that, we forget about that at our peril. And the critical lesson for us is you've got to fix that stuff to fix democracy. Democracy isn't some sort of ethereal idea, some sort of esoteric concept. It's a very real issue, and it happens in those buildings, and it happens in increments day after day. And without engaging with these places, then we're not going to fix democracy. So what we've done, or we're trying to do with our colleagues, is make these physical institutions into these digital institutions or digital services. And we're having a, a reasonable crack at that. As part of that lesson, the critical thing for us is about engagement. It's recognizing that if you want engagement, you have to build things worth engaging with. This is lasting powers of attorney. And Russell's already talked about what it is, so I don't have to do the explanation. But if you want, I think, a, a good example of, the, of what democracy looks like, it looks like this button here. Because there's an interesting story about lasting powers of attorney that we, we help the guys build it. And we got a phone call some months later saying, you know, you're going to have to come back and help our staff in the call center. And we're like, well, what is it now? And they said, well, you know, well people are phoning up and um, saying they really like it. But with, We've had nowhere to put that, because no one's ever given us positive feedback before. <laughs> so we have to build positive feedbacks right the way through the government's estate. That positive feedback button for me is the biggest sign that democracy is working, because you want to press that time and again. So this disconnect between what you can do outside and what you can do inside is stark. And as Russell mentioned before, the, politi the political versus the policy gap is so stark when you get into government. Let me give you a US example. This was well, well lauded as probably the, the best example of digital politics, the campaign for, from Obama's campaign in 2008, also in 2012, outside government. It looked great, and there's been lots of great articles written about it. And yet, when it comes into power, that's what you get with healthcare.gov. This disconnect between what you can do digitally outside government and then what services you provide inside government is becoming all too apparent. Those services are the, promise, are the delivery on the electoral promise. That's what democracy looks like, and that disconnect cannot go on. That's why we focus on services. So the first lesson is when you get in, go really deep, go at the big bits of government and focus on the services that they provide. Lesson number two for us. Oh, by the way, it all sounds great now. We didn't say this three years ago. Oh, no, we were going to fix democracy and have some bus stop apps. You know, we, we were going to do all that. So this, is, uh, this lesson's been a long time coming. The next, time, the next point is that government as a platform has to come in many favors. Can I just ask a sample? Who's familiar with the phrase government as a platform in here? 
Tim O'Reilly, Gummers of Platform. So the idea of Gummers of Platform, I should have explained this. Tim wrote a, uh, a piece uh, several years ago, the idea that government has, should be enabling platform service to be provided. Uh, so rather than a sort of one-size-fits-all service model, I think his analogy was that you put your money in a... Um, in a, in a drinks vending machine and you shake the machine if you don't get what you want but you're still only going to get one flavour of drink is that actually government should enable platforms and on those platforms uh, a heterogeneous mix of services can apply and there's a healthy feedback loop between users and the state and therefore that those platforms will enable much more reactive capacity between government and individuals rather than a one size fits all very expensive model and that's fine that's really good as a idea of a technological construct, we buy that. But the problem is, and I've talked with Tim about this, is the problem is that that governs the platform, I feel, came in couched in the language of Silicon Valley. It came in with a sort of economic laissez-faire model that comes from the west coast of the US, because technology is, of course, all about making billions of pounds by starting Instagram. We all know that, right? Because there's a complete absence of a connection between that idea, which is a technological construct, and the delivery of public services, and indeed a public ethos. And this is why I want to talk at, at, at Thayer's conference today about Best of British, because I think we can marry these two ideas, because our version of government as a platform can be and should be inspired by our past and by our public service ethos. And I don't mean our very recent past, and I don't mean about some of the services we're fixing. I mean the long-term past. We have a history. There are many things that we've done in the public realm that are the envy of the world. We're not good at boasting in this country, and that's probably a good thing. But we often hide our light under a bushel because we've set the way over hundreds of years in the public realm. And we should look at that and learn from, uh, from those things and what lessons we can learn from the past that we can apply to a form of government as a platform. Let me explain a bit more. You all know who this guy is. It is, of course, from... And he said O-level history then, and then very few of you will have done an O-level. Um, uh, this is James Brinley, and he was, of course, the father of canal engineering. Uh, there were lots of canal engineers, but he famously created a system of canals uh, in God's own country, the northwest of England. And... Um, it, what Brindy realized was that you could network what was already there. So these small canals serving individual factories and services, and he linked them all up to create a canal network which vastly accelerated the growth of the Industrial Revolution. Well done him. Well, we fast forward 250 years, and you could argue that he was ahead of his time because what he realized was something uh, what we now call small pieces loosely joined, that you don't have to engineer everything from the start. And behind Brindley's ideas and behind his delivery was a fundamental grasp of a network model. These are Carl Baran's famous network diagrams. And I think in this country, we, we, we always, we don't think about this enough, but we assume that we have an, a federated network. So th those models are centralized, decentralized, and distributed. In the UK, we talk about network models as if we do a federated model, and we very rarely do. We have this constant back and forth between central and local. And what Brindley realized is if you link stuff up, the federation of those linked services is far more powerful and far more durable than the binary nature of the first two. So to put that in government context and political context, we're not talking about centralized or localized. We think that's a false, false binary. We're talking really as government as a network. A government as a network of services and a network of uh, standards that all work together. So whilst we've got industrial models or pre-industrial models of the ideas that are espoused in government as a platform, we've also got probably, uh, we've probably got more examples closer to home. Uh, and another sort of industrial era model, some of you may have seen me talk about these. Uh, this guy, this is of course uh, William Bazalgette, and he invented the sewers. Bully for him. Um, and this is what one looks like, because you might want not, not have seen one recently. Um, it's interesting to note that Basil Jett's exam question was to fix the cholera ec epidemic. It was not to enable the growth of London. Um, but he did, because he, uh, he realized <laughs> that there was another sort of internet meme. So we've had, you know, small things loosely connected. He built a series of tubes and they're rather large. Um, they pretty much come into the end of their life at the moment, but that's 
150, 160 years after he built them. He built massive capacity. London just was not that big a city. And he built huge capacity. He re-engineered lots of things like the embankment, lots of um, um, bits of London. He also connected bits of the system that already existed. So like Brindley, he built... Uh, he, he connected a small part. Also, he built huge capacity, a series of tubes. But he went further because he created these things, because he realized something else about infrastructure. This is Crossness, which is a pumping station in southeast London. It's near Crystal Palace. And the, uh, the system of sewers he built had four stations where they came up, uh, and this is one of them. And it's a complete folly. There are a couple of... Uh, there are a couple of steam pumps down there, but effectively the building was a complete folly. But people used to go, they say, well, let's go to the sewers. Let's go and have a look at the sewers. We have a day out. And people did. The Prince Regent went for lunch once. And you could go and have a look at the sewers. Great. Because what he realized is that utility, a massive public utility, also needs to be appreciated and to be beautiful. And he built these beautiful things. And that's why, fast forward again, 150 years, we were delighted to get this because we tried to build beauty into our digital platforms, as he built beauty into the infrastructure platforms. So let's just look at what Brindley and Bazalgette did. And you could call it hardware as a public service, because it's got the same characteristics of many of the things that we're trying to do digitally today. Because what we're trying to do is software as a public service. And we shouldn't shy away from talking about the values of software and the values of what we do as inherently public and having a public ethos. Because we've got a strong and profound legacy of a public ethos powering huge um, public good in this country, whether it be industrial or post-industrial. Put that hardware and put that software together, and we call that the GovStack. And it's an emergent idea that actually we can build a stack of technologies that can power a federated system of government. Because one of the one of the reflections on the last three years is that we can't continue painting rusty trains. There's only so much you can do with a rusty train. And invention is what's needed because painting these doesn't really help. What we need to do is build some more of these. And we're pretty good at that in this country as well. But what we should do is actually use a federated system of government so everyone can participate in that. So. In short, government as a platform, we feel, is a fantastic idea. It has been for probably a decade since Tim really made it popular. But without some form of public service ethos, it's just another Silicon Valley buzzword. And that really doesn't suit our public uh, ethos and our public values that we have. It, sh it didn't suit us in an industrial era, and there's no reason why it should suit us in a digital era, because one of the things that you realize when you're in government, and it doesn't take long to realize, is this, is that you don't pivot. You have to be very, very consistent and very focused on the long term, and you haven't got time with the ebb and flow of technological fads and fashions. One has to be consistent, and what you have to do is build services that endure and build them with user needs at the heart. So, I'm trying to summarize this, we we believe that network, beautiful, digital public services are the key to a strong, equitable relationship between the citizen and the state. That's quite an important idea, that services are the bedrock of democratic engagement. And that's something that we think is a valid basis on which to construct a digital government and a digital political future for us. The conference went OK. It's fair to say we weren't the highlight. Some bloke in an embassy somewhere was. Um, but then we had a chat, because sitting in a park in New York, we sort of realized that this idea and ideas similar to these are happening all over the world. Russell's men mentioned Estonia. We just talked today about what this could mean in a British context with our British political, economic, and industrial history. But this idea of governance as a platform needs to be put in context all over the world, and one could argue it is. This is Anders Ansip. He was, until recently, the Prime Minister of Estonia. This is him. This is the cabinet room. That's what it looks like. You bring your own device to the Estonian cabinet. How about that? Don't even have any laptops. You used to, you used to have laptops embedded in, the, in each pe person's uh, 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 desk. Now you bring your own. And there's a live stream of people uh, uh, connecting to the, 
the cabinet and talking to them as they're making decisions. That's what digital government looks like in Estonia. There are other organizations that are leading this from a, a, a municipal background. This is Code for America. This is Jen Polka. And what Jen has done with Code for America is start up these sorts of movements that suits American city-state level. She's just spent a year in, in Washington seeing how completely balked that is. Um, this is Santiago Siri. Um, and Santiago, so disillusioned with the politics of Buenos Aires, he formed his own political party, putting the basic tenets of open internet governance at the idea of how we should engage. And it's fair to say that the political system is engaging him very, very quickly. I'd love to be at, at dinner at their house because his partner went one step further. This is Pia Mancini. And Pia uh, had an a all too modest idea of changing the world by making an operating system for democracy. It's called Democracy OS. It's about 20% built at the moment. These people are putting government as a platform within the governance systems of their countries in a way that suits them, within the public ethos of those countries, because we're all not the same. This is a guy called Hernan Moreno, and Hernan uh, realized something a long time ago that the emergence of digital government, when we'd all, if we weren't careful, we would all call things different things. So he did the uh, ever so easy task of convening every single president and prime minister in a, an entire continent of the Americas into, into Honduras and getting them all to sign something called a white book. So if, to this day, when you call something in one country uh, in that continent, it can be interoperable with another country. These are people who are delivering governments as a platform day after day. It might just be that in our case, we're leading the world because our focus is on services. Our focus is on the actual, the, the, the multitude of services we give to the people of this country. One of the things traveling around the world and seeing all these people do government as a platform in their own way, you realize is that the service offering is still some way away. They just don't, don't offer the rich mix of public services that we've been offering in this country for for hundreds of years. So in Reading, with DEFRA, we're applying agile transformation as a common agricultural policy that distributes around six billion pounds a year in this country to 110,000 farms. Um, in Swansea, with DVLA, we're creating new motoring services. Indeed, some of these are live now. You can go and check your penalty points right now, if, if indeed you have any. Um, in Newcastle and London with HMRC, we're building exemplars to transform the architecture of taxation. So in future, it shouldn't just become a one-time, once-a-year hit. It should be woven into the digital fabric of our economic life. And in Manchester, MOJ are about to start to transform in courts after working out how to do this with Office of Public Guardian and others. So it's happening all over the country. And hopefully one day, we'll have a digital civic infrastructure of which we can all be proud, but that civic infrastructure won't happen in a big bang procurement, and it won't be bought from a big company. It will emerge as a federated system, and it will emerge from small pieces loosely joined. And when it does emerge, I think we should, there'll be some moments, there'll be some critical moments when we know it's here, and I suspect the most symbolic moment and the most obvious moment will, well, will be when we move out of buildings like this, which is Manchester Town Hall, and into buildings like this, which is the Reichstag, because this is what government should look like, open and transparent and participative. participative. So that's the idea. If we can build a GovStack, we can engage all our colleagues in government with a federated system of government. And what we can do over time is build a digital civic infrastructure, which is up there with the uh, industrial era of Basil Jess and Brindley. We're not short of ambition, but maybe you could help build it too. Thanks very much.